Diraj um, Singh Rana asks a, a fundamental question, what is pain? Instead of going through all these definitions that have been put out there, why not try something which is really simple and clinical? We will have pain when our brains weigh the world, everything going on outside and inside, and makes a credible judgment that there's more danger than safety. Equally, we will not have pain when our brains weigh the world and judge that there's more safety out there in there than danger. Great question, but the key thing is, danger and safety hides in hard to find places. And when you can grasp how important context is and how important distributed processing is, you'll realize that many, many, many things out there can have an influence on pain, both centered up and down. What do you say to a patient who says, so it's just in my head? Well, I've got to tell you sometimes, if your clinical interaction skills are good enough and powerful enough, you can say, right on, you've got it. But of course, it's much bigger than that. I would say, no, it's never just in your head. It's in your body, it's in your life. And yeah, the brain may well be boss, but it's much, much, much bigger than in your head. And I think I'd probably apologize if some health professional out there has told a patient, it's just all in your head. I'd apologize on behalf of the health professions for being a little bit, not just a little bit, out of date. Medicinal marijuana for pain. We just don't have the data to support introduction of, of this, in my view. Uh, but it's coming in and it's very fashionable. Uh, and I really hope that we don't realise in 10 years that it's opioids too, or something like that. So that's a little political perspective that I have. The fact that we've got no idea what doses people are giving themselves according to method of, of giving it, preparation or temperature it's at, whether it's in a cookie or it's uh, smoked. These things, we've got no idea of the dose. We've got no idea of, of how quickly it's processed in the body. So we can't be prescribing these things with any accuracy. And I think that's a potentially dangerous situation. Uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't have it, I'm just saying we, we need to understand it better before everyone starts using it for medicinal purposes. With this biopsychosocial model, um, and often this focus on um, psychological or social factors, where does the bio fit into all of this? It's interesting because I actually don't think we can even separate them. Like I think sometimes separating them is part of the problem because I guess the bio underlies psycho, it underlies social. If you're feeling stressed, if you're fe feeling anxious, there are biological processes behind why you're feeling that. And then there's also biological processes that then contribute to them further. Like there was a fascinating study that was looking at um, if you remove uh, afferent input from the face, so people that get Botox and then end up um, being unable to make like a grimace, they have been studied and shown that they can't get as angry <laughs> because you get feedback from your facial muscles of a grimace. And so I think even with things like anxiety, oftentimes, for example, as we get anxious, as we get nervous, we're starting often to get tension in the shoulders. So then we have this biological afferent feedback that's going back and sustaining this state. Children who fall over in the playground experience a broad range of responses from their parents, ranging from a toughen up type of indifference right through to overt and excessive concern. How might these parental responses, among others within a family, shape a developing child's ongoing pain experience that might persist into adulthood? Great question. I'm not the best person to answer that one. There are people studying how parental responses to children's pain uh, affect subsequent pain experiences. I would say the impact of a parent's response to, to my injury, if I'm the child, will be highly informative and will be highly influential on, on what my brain produces. And I, I've got a great experience as a parent. When I came home from work one day, I was, I was living and working in England, and on the three days of summer we had one year, I came home and, and my son Henry saw me coming and ran. Dad, Dad's home from, from work. And it was, he would have been two and a half, maybe three years old and someone had moved a table into the corridor and Henry ran straight into the table. 
hit it full bore. His legs went out in front of him and he fell on his backside and then he was sitting there and I could see the lump growing on his forehead and I'm a pain scientist. So I didn't want to give him any cues. So I just sat and stared at him like this. And Henry was looking at me and his facial expression suggested he was thinking, what's wrong with dad? And then he kept running and we played, kicked a ball around in the backyard for a while. And he showed no sign that he was in pain. Now I'm not saying we should not give any feedback uh, to children when they're injured because I think that's how they learn. Social learning I think is critical in pain, absolutely critical. So yeah, as parents, we will have an effect. What is one piece of advice you would give to someone suffering from persistent pain? Find a clinician that listens. Find a clinician that is happy to hear your whole story and is happy to explore some of the history that you've had and can give you some help in, I guess, addressing different situations and how you might be able to cope in those situations. One of the hardest things is when you actually have chronic pain is getting someone that is helping you to explore ways that you might be able to go forward and ways you might be able to cope in your individual situation. And if you can't find that person, ask around as much as you can. Benjamin Butler Bonice uh, has given me the, the toughest assignment uh, so far of this week's pain revolution and has asked me to explain fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia means pain in muscles and other connective tissue. How's that? Is that? I hope that's satisfying. I, I, I don't understand fibromyalgia biology well enough to explain it, and I would argue that no one on the planet does. The only way that I would be comfortable explaining fibromyalgia is to say fibromyalgia is a, is a persistent pain state with multiple contributions from multiple domains uh, that is well and truly overprotective. Uh, and I know that's not very satisfying, but that reflects our current understanding of the biology. Uh, and I'm sorry to disappoint you there on that, Benjamin. Here's a great question. How can we change people's general knowledge before they, come, before they become patients about pain and pain management? Look, that's a really, really good question. And if I reflect on my clinical life, I would have to say that the ideal way to deal with this massive, expensive and horrible epidemic in society is to preempt it. And that means going into schools, going into sporting clubs, going to parents and teaching them about pain before they get a problem. You know, if somebody was, was doing some research out there, I reckon you could go to a sporting club and go in and give maybe uh, two by 20 minutes with a bit of a follow-up and a few multimedia links. You could go in and, uh, and teach these people about pain. And I reckon there'd be far less, uh, less issues with, with return to field or pain problems later. But research has to go there yet. But yes, let's go young. Let's teach it in the schools and the sporting clubs. Alex Chisholm writes, what changes do you think healthcare professionals need to institute in the treatment of acute pain in order to help prevent transition to chronic pain states? Wow, <clears throat> uh, I think about this a lot, Alex, and uh, in my role at the University of South Australia, I'm chair of physiotherapy, so part of my role is, is to work with the the clinical education and the uh, lecturing teams uh, on, a, on a cognitive culture. And the thing that I'm working hard on there is to shift the idea, particularly in musculoskeletal physiotherapy, to shift the idea of us being pathology detectors and correctors to us being facilitators of recovery. And uh, I think we have a great skill set to detect when things are truly structurally out. But we, I think we have to be really honest uh, in appraising the value and the validity of those tests. And I think our mindset should always be, how do I facilitate recovery rather than what can I detect that's wrong and try and correct it? And that, that's a, I think that's a subtle but a really important difference. Uh, that's how I think healthcare professionals could change to, and I guess it's almost like remembering that healing is an irresistible force. For too long, we've just got in the way of it, I think. And learning is an irresistible force. 
And I think for too long we've, we've facilitated learning of things that are not, not helpful. Does the health industry need to change the way it understands and treats pain? If yes, what are your suggestions? Well, my answer to that question is a resounding yes. Um, and I think some of the way that it needs to, to really change is to, is to move away from this solely biomechanical understanding of pain. And that's hard because that's what we've learned actually growing up is, you know, when something hurts, it's because we've injured it. And yet the vast majority of pain science knowledge and literature suggests that that's indeed not the case. There's many things that modulate and contribute to our pain experience. We're also asked what are some of the great advances in pain sciences now that will have an impact in the future? Well, for me, it comes down to one major thing, and this comes from the many domains of pain sciences. It's for me now to be confident to say to a patient or a client that it's not just all about management, that treatment is on the cards and that cure is on the cards for some. I'm not saying it's easy, it can be bloody hard, but for me to be able to say that, that comes from a knowledge of basic sciences, of bioplasticity, but increasingly now 20 plus well done randomized clinical trials that show that effective education combined with quality movement change can make a huge difference. That'll do.